workshop. Um, normally we do this workshop in person at the Randall Davy Audubon Center in Santa Fe, but I'm really excited to have a broad audience of folks joining in today from across the state and from even further away. When we normally do this workshop in person, we typically spend a lot of time outside looking at tracks. Um, so we're encouraging that if it's safe for you to do so, to take what you learned today and head outside to practice looking for some tracks, perhaps after the webinar this evening. Um, today's program is free and we realize that times are tough for many of us, but we really would appreciate any donations that you are able to give. Your support goes directly to our nonprofit education programs and allows us to provide programming and materials to students across Santa Fe. We will drop a link to our donation page in the chat box if you are interested. Thank you. Um, so today I'm happy to introduce our workshop leader, Anne Hunkins. Anne is a Santa Fe based naturalist, birder and animal tracker. She's been tracking for over a decade and she is a level four certified tracker with the cyber tracker program. So I'm going to pass it off to Anne now and she is going to dive into tracking wildlife across New Mexico. So go ahead, Anne, I'm going to unmute you. Okay, great. Hi, can everybody hear me? Okay, great. Hi, it's, uh, this is, it's great to be here and to know there's a lot of you out there. Um, it's sort of ironic since we can't meet in person, that means a lot more people can join this. So that's kind of a really cool thing about it. Um, I've been doing animal tracking for about 10 years pretty seriously. Um, I've been teaching classes for at least half of that time. Um, so this cyber tracker certification that Sally just mentioned, I just wanted to mention that. Um, that is a lot of my learning has been through that. Um, cyber tracker, it's kind of a misnomer. It's really not anything that has to do with online. Um, what it is, is in the, uh, some years ago in South Africa, Louis Liebenberg and some people there were doing um, research on game preserves and they were hiring Bushman trackers who are the most amazing trackers in the world to do a lot of their data research and they wanted to make sure that they were getting the best data they could and so they made up an evaluation system for these Bushman trackers and that became something that went worldwide and now you can do these evaluations all over the world around here in Germany, the United States, um, South Africa are the ones that I know about, and I'm sure other countries as well. And that is a really good learning tool. You really get to see what's going on. Um, they take you out in the field, which is what I would do too, if we were all together and show you things and ask you what they are and you have to give a definitive answer. And then you find out and you get a score but your mind is fully opened up by that experience so that you get the full impact of it. So that's been a lot of how I've learned. I also took one class with Tom Brown and did some of John Young's teachings. Um, for me, you know, tracking is a real basic thing that um, it really brings your level of awareness up. We're really, we're high, uh, Sally, if you could go to the next slide for a second. Um, yeah, we're really, you can see this is a slide um, from the Valles Caldera of the elk out there. And you can see how they're just way out there. They're super aware of the people, us, me taking the picture. And um, we as humans are also hardwired for that same level of awareness that they have right there. Because that's how we evolved. All of us knew how to track, as our ancestors all knew how to track, otherwise we wouldn't be here. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Um, tracking, like I was saying, it's ancestral. It's something we all have, no matter what your lineage is. It's, you've got it there in your background, how, however far back it may be. And maybe you had it in this generation, if, if you're one of the lucky people. Um, but my goal is to make it as widespread as possible in this generation, so that in the future, more and more people will be aware of it. It's really a way to be aware of the natural world, our place on the land, to learn natural history. In order to get good at tracking, you really need to learn a lot of natural history so you'll know where to even go to start looking for tracks. 
And they've done some studies where it actually promotes reading skills. Tracking is a kind of a reading. If you think about it, you're following, you know, you, you follow a string of words that makes a sentence. When you're tracking, you're following a string of tracks that makes a sentence of tracking a type of understanding of what that animal is doing in the world. And I also like to say that it's good to ask permission and to give thanks. And what I mean by that, ask permission when you're going to go out tracking, say you've come upon a super fresh, awesome bobcat track, and you're going to try to follow this track as far as you can. Say in the snow, maybe you can follow it really far. And I always like to just take a minute and give thanks to that animal and to this opportunity that allows you to be there to do that and to make sure that it's okay not just sort of more on a spiritual level, but like, is it okay? Is it safe for that animal? Are you going to be putting pressure on that animal if you are going to spend a lot of time tracking them? So that those are the kind of things that I really would like to have in mind when I start tracking and I teach that in all my classes. Um, great, can we have the next slide there? So this is the really fun part of tracking. Um, I just had to put this picture up. This is from one of these tracking evaluations where people are looking super closely at a track before they make their final answer of what that track is. So you, if you get obsessed enough at tracking, you may find yourself in such a situation. Um, all right, let's go to the next one. Okay, um, now, one of the things that's super important in tracking is noticing what the birds are doing when you're out there. Um, this bird right here in the picture is a spotted towhee, and that bird can really tell you a lot about what's going on if you pay attention to them. They say when a cat goes by, when a dog comes up, when people go by, if you really watch these birds, they react. Of course, they'll react when you walk up, generally by flying away, or they might just complain, you know. But if you pay a lot of attention to that, um, you may find out a lot. Uh, and then what I said before, learning a lot about the natural history of your area. You want to learn what animals and birds are in your area and where they prefer to be. What do they eat? Where do they sleep? What's, where's their prey or, or where would their predators be coming from? And that, all that sort of thing. Uh, something that we're going to be doing a lot is looking at tracks during this class. So these are just the basic things. You're going to want to count, you know, count the toes, look at the heel pad shapes, look at the angles, look at the symmetry, but you're going to want to stack up evidence. So you're not going to say something like, oh, that track doesn't have nails, so it can't be a dog or something like that. Not just for one thing. You're not going to just identify a track by one attribute. You're going to stack up different evidence, and we're going to talk about that as we go along. And we're also going to learn animal gaits and track patterns and differences between the front hind, left and right feet. <clears throat> and then on a more advanced level, when you start to figure out how old tracks are, you're going to really have to pay attention to the weather. Um, in order to know that, like whether did it rain before this track, after this track, and that sort of thing. Um, Rachel, I meant to ask you, did you have some answers about people's, uh, how much tracking people have done in the past? I think that was a poll question in the beginning. I can throw that poll up now, Ann. Oh, yeah, why don't you go ahead and do that? Yeah, sorry, I should have mentioned that. So for, for everyone that's watching, you should see a poll question come up. We're going to use this function throughout the webinar today. So you can record your answer there and we'll get to see the results. Um, and if you need to, later we're going to be asking you what types of tracks you think you're seeing on screen. So you will be able to move that little poll box um, like side to side on your own screen. Great, looks like there's a good mix of people out there. People who have never been tracking, people who have been tracking many times, awesome. Sweet, that's just good to know. All right, looks like the majority have been out at least once or twice. All right, um, yeah, great, thanks Sally. So before we sort of get really deep into this, um, we're going to just do a sense meditation. 
we're here, you know, online in this kind of virtual reality, but I'd like everybody where you are to really try to sink into your senses and into your body for a few minutes. And the, the ways to do that generally are to get into the senses, to get out of our thinking heads. A lot of times when we go out in the woods and animals run away from it, it's not even necessarily the noise we're making, it's our head, you know, we're thinking about all this stuff. They can sense that, that kind of energy about us. So let's just breathe a little bit, take some deep breaths, let all that stuff drop away, whatever's in the head right now. And maybe open a window if you're in your room so you can hear something, or if you're on a mobile device, you could even walk outside for a second. So these are just some things you could choose one of these. Try to hear the quietest sound you could hear, smell or feel the air, look at something, maybe a square foot of ground or, or the tulips on this screen if there's nothing else. Um, for a second really closely. Maybe close your eyes if you want to, it's up to you. Just choose one thing and focus on it. And we're just gonna take one minute and just really sink into our senses. Okay, great. I can feel that in me just settling in. Once you've done that, it's gonna be a lot easier to listen to your inner voice and your gut when you're out there and trying to think to yourself, where can I find a track? Where will I find an animal? When you're in this kind of state, it's really helpful. Okay, um, like I said before, don't be afraid to get your feet dirty. <laughs> And <laughs> you may end up looking like this. Uh, all right, we're gonna just start with, um, let's bring up, uh, Sally, can you bring up that first video? This is a video that I shot yesterday at the Audubon Center. Go ahead. Is the uh, sound on that or not? Oh, sorry, hold on one second. So if we were running this us in person here at the Audubon Center. What I'd do is we'd be walking along this trail and I have marked certain things for us to look at. Look, here's a flag we're coming up to. Yeah, cool. Here is some mule deer scat. It's pretty much all over the place here. So you see these pellets. You can find it uh, all over here because the mule deer Really, really love it here. Great, thanks, Sally. All right, we're going to go back to these frequently asked questions. The first kind of question that everybody wants to know the answer to is how do you tell feline from canine tracks? Can everybody hear me there? Okay. Um, so, how do you tell feline from canine? So as you can see in here, the main, the main big difference, if you're not seeing a lot of detail, is that the feline track overall is gonna be very round, just the whole outline of the track, whereas the canine are gonna be very long and slender. Um, 
the feline, but another major thing is that the, maybe you can point this out, Sally, with your mouse, the feline tracks heel pad is going to be very trapezoidal looking as opposed to triangular like a canine track. You can see that it's more of a trapezoid. That's really diagnostic. The other thing is, if you look at, say, look at this track, how many toes of that track can I pull into the heel pad? When you look at the feline track on the right, Maybe you could pull in, I don't know, one, two, three. You might even be able to pull in all four of those toes into the heel pad, or at least three of them. Whereas the canine track on the left, say you pull in one of those canine tracks toes into the heel pad, then you maybe have room for another one if you're lucky. You definitely don't have room for a third one. So what it is is the proportion of the toes to the heel pad is really different. The toes proportional to the heel pad are smaller in a feline larger in a canine. The thing about nail showing is that yes, almost always, especially on domestic dogs, the nails are going to be showing, they're going to be big and thick, but some, there'll be some canines who don't necessarily show their nails, like fox for instance. They don't always show because they're kind of walking along with their, with their foot cocked up like this. Let's look at the next one because that kind of leads into the next point here. <clears throat> and that is how do you tell domestic dog from coyote. So here you can really see how on the left those coyote tracks are super slender, long, delicate. The dog tracks on the right, um, they're like very splayed out. They're not delicate. The um, nails are very thick and blunt and they don't necessarily, the toes don't necessarily all point forward. Whereas on the coyote they do all point forward. And on the coyote hind track, you're looking at a front and hind track. And the front track is bigger in these animals because that's where all their weight is on the front of the animal. Sometimes the coyote hind track, that heel pad is so small, it's just a dot. Can you point to that, Sally? Yeah, right there. Sweet. Okay, let's see the next one. Oh, not that one yet. Yeah, there you go. Then the other big one is, have I found a mountain lion track? Because that's a super exciting thing um, for most people to find. Um, <clears throat> a lot of times what people ha have sent me and I think might be a mountain lion track turns out to be a dog track. So that's why I wanted to put these two right together here. You can really see that difference, how the mountain lion has that trapezoidal heel pad and the dog has the triangular, for one thing. For another thing, just generally size. An average adult mountain lion track is going to be so much bigger than almost any dog you can think of overall. And also the mountain lion track is really not going to be showing nails. Dog tracks are almost always showing nails. Sometimes though, if you look over the coyote track, they might not show the nails. Those nails are so fine that depending on the substrate that they land in, they might not show up. One other thing to notice is that that mountain lion track is very asymmetrical. Can you point that left mountain lion track, Sally? See how asymmetrical those toes are? They kind of slant to the side. And on the right-hand track, too, they, the whole heel pad is slanted at a different angle than the toes. With a dog, there's no asymmetry per se. It's all pretty symmetrical. But that the, and the outside toes point outward a lot. So that are, those are some of the things to think about when you're trying to figure out if you saw a mountain lion track or not. OK, let's go to the next one. Um, all right, so let's do put a poll question up. Whose track is this? Just based on all that, take a couple seconds. <clears throat> yeah, awesome. Okay, great. We've definitely got, are, is, are most people done? Should I? Yeah, okay. So the winner is mountain lion, cougar. And that looks like 61% of you said that. That's pretty awesome. And the reason, well, look, I'm just going to go over this here. If you can kind of point, Sally, point to that trapezoidal heel pad, right? And then thinking about trying to pull those toes into the track, you could pull definitely one, definitely two, possibly part of a third one. 
And one thing to notice about that rule is the one on the left is the hind track, the track on the left. And that tends to look slightly more like a canine track, just in the fact that the heel pad takes up less of the space than the front track. Because once again, it's, this is the, um, the felines also have other weight on the front. Okay, great. Let's, uh, fantastic. Let's go look at the next one. Yeah, okay, whose track is this? All right, fantastic. Almost everybody is saying that it's a canine track, which is absolutely right. The only difference is between whether it is a domestic dog or a coyote track. And if what I'm looking at here is when you look at that, those super long, maybe if you can point that out, Sally, the super long blunt nails, look how wide they are. Those nails, like on the, that left hand most nail is almost, a extension of that toe in a way it's that thick and long and wide now if you look at the heel pad of the right one it does look more coyote like so i'll give you that for those who said coyote i can see that a little bit but uh, but coyotes just don't have nails that that are that big thick and blunt and you can see also a little bit how these, um, the side toes are kind of, how can I say it? They're a little bit bloopy. They're not, let, Sally, point at that middle toe. Um, the one in the very middle of the picture is the left toe of the right track. <clears throat> um, go down, down, yeah, just go down more. Yeah, right there, that toe. Right, now that's slightly obscured there because of the double track, you know, this is the hind print coming down on the front print, but it's, it's pretty wide and, and like sloppy looking also. But mostly I'm going on the nails in this one. So this just shows you how it's not always definitive. There definitely are cases where you can't tell the difference or it's really hard between domestic dog and coyote. But let's go look at the next one. All right, who is this track? Sweet. All right. Um, you can move that pole to the right, just so you know, if you're, if you're not able to see the track, you can just click on the top bar and drag it out of the way. Um, all right. So yeah, it looks like the vast majority of you said Bobcat, and that's awesome. And maybe you can just point out, Sally, the, the major thing there is those those three lobes at the back of the track. I didn't mention this earlier, sorry. <laughs> um, show you, that is so typical of a, key, of a feline track, especially either a bobcat or mountain lion. But when you just look at the ruler, you can tell that um, it's way too small to be a mountain lion. Somebody's asking, what's the bird track? I think those are robin tracks going through there. I'm not 100% sure, but that's what that one looks like where it's real peeled, the, the outside toes kind of peel out to the side. 
Okay, let's look at the next one. All right, here's the last one of this series. What's this track? Sweet, you guys are awesome. All right, so the vast majority of people said Coyote on this. We had a significant portion that said Bobcat. Um, maybe Sally, you could just point out the heel pad on the bottom one there. That really shows, you can really see this triangular, right? It's very canine. You only see two lobes on the back there, not one on the back of that heel pad. And as for between domestic dog or coyote, you can see how extremely fine those nails are, right? Only the middle, like only the middle two and maybe that left hand nail just barely registered. Look how much finer those are than the domestic dogs that we looked at. Super cool, good job, you guys are doing great. All right, let's look at the next slide here. I don't actually have a poll question on this one. Um, I just wanna talk about this. See how much smaller this is? Because this is a tough one. Um, what I just, just, um, you, I don't know. I mean, this could be the ones where you could throw your idea into chat. And Rachel, maybe you could just throw out some ideas. Looks like someone's got a hand raised. OK, so someone said domestic cat, fox, wild dog, fox, fox. Yep, okay, those are great ideas. Are these hand raised so you can put your guess in there? Is that right? Okay, yeah, a lot of people, yeah. So the two that there were was domestic cat and fox that I saw a lot of. And um, yeah, that's super, super common for that, for those two, two to be confused is what I wanted to say there because um, it actually is a fox track. Uh, look how small it is compared to my finger there, right? Very small, round. You're not really not seeing the nails, although you might not in that soft snow. And very triangular heel pad. Maybe you can show that, Sally. Um, fox tracks can look a little bit like, more like a bobcat. Like it would be a, that would be a really big domestic cat if you've seen domestic cat tracks. Those of you who have cats, that would be more likely to be about the length of one, you know, a joint and a half on my finger instead of these two joints long that that is. One thing that really is distinctive about this is look at that big pile of snow in the very middle of the track. That is very characteristic of Fox, that there's a lot of negative space in between. Okay, so let's go to the next one. And I just want to do a quick time check. It is 4.30, so we're halfway through the webinar. I just want to let you know that. Okay. Yeah, cool. Okay, thanks. Let's go to the next one. So this is a real fun track. This is, um, I'm just going to kind of rush through this a little bit because there's a lot I want to show you. I want you to like, this is actually a badger track. And we're going to see some of these in a second. But what I want you to do, this is about left, right track. A lot of animals, their left and their right is just like our left and right. So put your hand up, you don't have to touch your screen, against that left track there, the one on the left side, I mean, and see how your fingers and the bobcat and the badger fingers, they pretty much match there, right? As far as which ones are longer. So you can tell right off looking at that, that that is a left-hand track. And let's just quickly look at that uh, badger trail video.
Okay, so we're out here in this big arroyo. I turn and I look over here on the hillside. You see this big hole with this giant throw mound in front of it. Can we look at the one that has the trail, Sally? This is great too. This is a better jig. Right. But I since so, you have a little little brush off yeah. arroyo. And we have seen we've seen a badger dig further up. And we are looking at these tracks, which are, you can see that there is long claws out ahead, an asymmetrical heel pad. And right here is a really great one. Look at those five toes. One, two, three, four, five. And the heel pad. And if you look right here, it looks like there's a little digging going on. It's what our badgers like to do. And then the trail continues. Okay, great. Thanks, Sally. Cool. Um, let's see where we're at here. Right. Okay. So let's just... Uh, we're just going to quickly go through some other kinds of tracks. The next one, I think everybody's going to recognize. The next slide. Yeah, I think everybody's going to recognize that as pretty much raccoon tracks, right? And then the one after that, we'll show you what they look like in the mud. So they might, you've got the hind track on the right and the front track on the left there. The hind track's going to be bigger in raccoons because that's where they're all, their weight is not on the front, it's more on their, on their back, on the back. So that's the hind track she's circling right there. And, they, and the way, um, yeah, I'm going to demonstrate in a couple minutes how raccoons walk differently. But let's just go through a few more of these slides. There's some raccoon tracks on ice that were really cool. There is a raccoon track. If you covered that bottom toe, it would kind of be almost imitating a bobcat track. That can happen. But if you look carefully, what you'll see is the C curve at the front or left to us side of that heel pad, which is not at all like the front of a bobcat, which would be more of a front of a trapezoid there. And also just the arrangement of the toes is different. It's more, it's they're wider. And of course you got the fifth toe. Sometimes it'll be obscured though. Let's go to the next one. Okay, here's another animal you're gonna see us a lot of around here. This is a striped skunk track. And then there's gonna be a couple of examples coming after that. Or actually just one, this one example. All right, let's keep going because I, I just have so much to show you guys. Here we've got bear, that's what their kind of the diagram looks like. Then let's look at an actual bear track. This is actually right near the Audubon Center. This, um, this is like an, this is an overstep. These are, um, these are right tracks. Bears always look at the, uh, the right left is the opposite of what a barefoot human would be in my mind, the way I think of it. And this is an overstep walk. So you've got the hind foot on the left and the front foot on the right. I'm going to talk a little more about that in a second. Okay, then let's look at the next one. That's a big old beaver track. And then right after that, we're going to have a photo of one. So you see how that big fat track, maybe you can outline the track on the bottom, Sally. That big fat track, all you're seeing of it now is these two toes. The two long toes that horizontally go out there to the right, yeah. That's what's, that's usually, sometimes that's all you'll see in fact, is just those two long toes and nothing else. You might not even see that front track, which is showing on the top there. Can you point that out, Sally? Yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's rare to see an entire beaver track. Usually you just see a partial like this. Okay. And then the next one. Here we've got, um, let's do a quick poll question on this one. Uh, oh no, sorry, not yet. This is the, we've got elk on the left and deer on the right here. 
And then we're going to do a poll question on the, so you'll notice how the elk are kind of, they're more curved, they're more rounded, whereas the deer are more pointed at the top. Of course, they're smaller as well. Sometimes that is harder to tell in the field, but let's do the poll question on the next one. See if you can tell the difference. Awesome, right. Most people are saying that's deer, that's correct. You can see how pointy those toes are. Let's look at, what about the next one? Okay, can, every, can everybody see how rounded these are compared to the deer tracks? Yep, I kind of gave it away there by, by saying how rounded it was. But yeah, you can see how round these are. These are some nice elk tracks that I've actually found not very far from Santa Fe at the Marty, at the uh, Municipal Recreation Complex. Uh, cow tracks are going to be a lot bigger and round, much rounder than these. These are much more oval than what a cow track is going to be. All right, let's skip. Sally, can we skip to number 35? just in the interest of time, because there's something I need, really need to show you guys. Yeah, okay. What I wanna talk about here is gates. Um, that picture of the deer that Sally's gonna bring up again in a second here. Um, a lot of times you'll see you'll see a deer track. When you see a deer trail, you're looking at one deer track, going to the next deer track, and it doesn't necessarily look like four legs all together on the ground, right? And perhaps a lot of you who followed deer tracks know what I'm talking about. And when you look at this deer right here, you can tell why. Look at the left front, um, the left front leg of that deer. See how it's about to leave the ground as the deer moves off to the right, and the left hind track is coming right up and it is going to land exactly where that front track takes off. And it's going to look like one track on the ground. And then the same thing's gonna happen on the, on the other side. And so, yeah, thank you. So with this, yeah, put the gates up, that's good. And that is what's called the direct register walk. And that's a typical thing that deer do. And I'm just, and then there's the overstep walk on the next one over. The black uh, prints are the hind prints and the lighter gray are the front. So with the overstep, the hind foot oversteps the front. And then you have the pace lope and the gallop. And I just wanna kind of, can, can we switch to my view? Cause I wanna show what that is gonna look like. Usually I have somebody act this out. <laughs> okay. So in that picture, I guess we gotta go down a little further. In that picture, the deer, the deer is doing this, right? And so this foot is coming right there, going like that. But sometimes, a lot of times, what, for instance, canines, a lot of times what they do is this hind foot will come up in front of that foot. So you'll have a front track here and your hind foot will be in front of it. That's called an overstep walk or a trot. And then you've got some animals like raccoons who actually move one side of their body all at one time. So they've got the left side down like this. And then this whole right side just goes <clears throat> like that. And so what you end up with is what you're seeing right here. A hind foot 
and a front foot right next to each other. So if you see a right hind and a left front together, you're, even without knowing what animal it is, you can almost be sure that's raccoon. Let's go back to that gates for a second. Um, that's where the pace lope is what I just showed, what raccoons do, the one that's called pace lope. And of course, any animal can go into a gallop. That can happen anytime. Um, so I just wanted to show you guys what that looks like. All right. Yeah. These are some mountain lion tracks that I found. Very near the Audubon Center, as a matter of fact, last winter. Uh, the length of the stride, you can see on the left there how that is the hind track, partly obscuring the front track underneath. So it's a very slight overstep walk uh, in the snow there. And I think this is about a 20 inch stride. So that would be a walk. If the, the, the longer that stride gets, the faster that animal is moving, then you would know that animal was trotting until maybe they speed up into a gallop. And when they're galloping, then rather than this pattern where you're seeing two tracks and then two tracks and then two tracks. If they're galloping, you're gonna see a group of tracks and a space and a group of four tracks and a space and a group of four tracks and a space. Okay. So I think the next slide pretty much shows the same things we're, we're looking at here. This is in elk. And then let's look at the next one. A really important thing about tracking is looking at the tracks in the right light. So this was like fresh grass that had just been walked in by people actually. And the next track is a super cool one, the next slide, I mean. Yeah, see how beautifully those tracks show up? If you were on the other side of these tracks, you might not see them at all. So what you wanna have is the light on the other side of the tracks from you. You wanna basically be looking into the light at the track for it to show up. All right, maybe we have time to go through a few scats here. Um, that, as probably most people know, is a big old bear scat, mostly full of juniper. That is very near the Audubon Center. Um, okay. This one is a little bobcat scat. Those are, the bobcat scats tend to be very dense, all meat. They never have vegetable matter in them except maybe a few accidental pieces of grass, the way cats eat grass, but they don't eat vegetation in any amount. Um, and they tend to be segmented like that. Whereas the next one um, is a little, you can, now that sort of looks segmented. It's similar to the size of the bobcat, but look at the contents. That's all pinion shells. This is a little coyote track. I mean, sorry, track, <laughs> coyote scat. And the next one is a really super cool one that I included. This is a, look how tiny that is. It's barely two inches long. That's a little gray fox scat. And that fox, all it was eating was darkling beetles right there. And all you can see is darkling beetle shells. And that'll happen sometimes. You'll just see that they've eaten all of one thing. Like in the next uh, frame, this fox has eaten all Russian olive seeds. That's all that is. This is on, on the lip of a stock tank. Um, the next one just shows how animals come and leave scats all in one place sometimes. Often that means it's a hunting area or they're leaving some kind of communication for each other. And then you've got deer scat, which we saw earlier in the video. And right after that, just as a comparison, we've got elk scat. You can see how that is much rounder, chunkier, and bigger. All right, let's just go through, I don't know how many more, how much more time we have. Other signs, a lot of times you might find a kill site of a bird. And you might be wondering who did that. And one of the major things to look at would be whether that bird was plucked those feathers or whether they were sheared. Because if a mammal were responsible for this kill, you would see some sheared feathers like that. And if it were a bird of prey, they would most likely pluck them. Now mammals can also pluck them too. Yeah, that's great. Go on to the antler rubs, that's cool. 
these are really cool to see. The, the, um, on the one on the left happens to be an elk rub that's higher up the tree. The one on the right is a deer rub. These are the male deer and, and elk who rub their antlers in the fall. And they choose these really slender trees to do it on. I always thought they, they would be real thick trees, but no, they like the really slender, flexible trees to, to make their mark on. You might see skeletons out there. This one's right in Santa Fe, as a matter of fact. Okay, then this is, let's do this last poll question. This will be, um, I think you probably know which one this is, right? Great. Okay. Cool. So we've got a about half and half between deer beds and bear or deer beds and scrapes. So I'm just going to point out on the right, you can actually see the whole outline of the deer in that particular snow bed. Um, yeah, if you can point out, Sally, on the top right are those long leg bones. Those are the back legs of the deer as they're lying down. Those are the bottom of their back legs. And on the left, you can see kind of like their knees or their wrists on the whole left of that bed where they're sitting um, with their knees kind of tucked, with their hands, with their front paws kind of tucked, or sorry, hooves tucked under like that. And you can even see far to the left of the picture, I think, where their nose was in the snow or where they were breathing in the snow, all the way on the top left there. Um, yeah, right there. So that's the whole outline of the deer there. And on the left, the same thing. I mean, you can't really look very closely to see that there's not scraped there, but basically that was the snow was just melted by their body lying there and it's all compressed. So there's no scraping action. Okay, I guess we probably should, I, I got a lot more to show, but I think we should probably leave time for questions. Yeah. Oh yeah, this is a good one to, this is a, similar to what we just looked at, elk bed in the Valles Caldera. I love this one. Do you want to stop for questions now, Anne? Yeah, I think we should do that, right? Because we only have 10 more minutes. Great. Yeah, sure. So yeah, folks, if you have questions, feel free to type them into the chat box. Um, and then we'll have Rachel maybe read out some of those questions for Anne. Sure, we have a question um, from Rebecca, who's wondering that she's seeing a lot of bear scat recently, and she's seeing a lot of seeds and berries in that scat, but it's not seed and berry season. So she's wondering okay. where that food might be coming from. Right. Well, even though the seeds and berries are not, like they're not perfectly ripe right now, there's a lot of seeds and especially juniper seeds that are just still on the trees from last winter. And that is one of the major food, food sources that is available in the spring before a lot of other food sources become available. So that actually could be that one big bear scat we looked at in the picture here in the slideshow was actually juniper seeds. Great, so we've got another question here um, that is wondering how you can tell the difference between cougar and bobcat scat. Okay, great. Almost always um, it's going to be size and location and the, the size of a cougar scat, the difference between the fox scat and the coyote scat or the difference between coyote scat and bear scat is pretty much the same magnitude of difference as the difference between bobcat and cougar scat. So cougar scat's going to be a heck of a lot bigger. Also, cougars are super particular about where they leave their scat, so you're not just going to randomly see it most places, whereas bobcats like to leave it out in the open and mark places. Uh, cougars, the only place they usually do that is around a kill site. Um, otherwise, it's quite hard to see, actually. 
Great. We have a question here. Um, wondering where a good place is um, to have good luck finding some tracks. Okay, great. I'm going to have, yeah, maybe Sally, you could go to that end slide of, yeah, I did make a list of some places to go. Yeah, we're at a track around Santa Fe. These are some good areas. Buckman Road area, basically any area that's got some fine dirt, and there's a lot of that around here. Any, you know, dirt roads, hiking trails, maybe even where there's been construction, but it's not right in the middle of town, or even right in the middle of the town, you might find tracks. You kind of never know, and these tracking areas change based on the weather, based on you might have some great tracking areas, and suddenly there's a huge rain and washed that great tracking area out, but it created a different one. So there's not always just one, but dirt, certainly places to start are like around the Audubon Center are some good places. Out the Buckman Road, out that way, there's a lot of sandy areas. Any sandy arroyos, I've found some around the Marty Sanchez Recreation Complex, I've found good tracks uh, under road bridges. Um, and also a cool thing in your yard, if you have some, or just go find some sand and put out a little sand trap where you think the animals might be coming, put some fine dirt out there, leave it out at the night and then come back in the morning and see what you find. That is a really fun thing to do. Great, so we have a question here wondering if you see small piles that look like bear scat, but it's smaller, um, could that be coming from a different animal? Yeah, as far as they, if, if they look like bear scat, I'm assuming you're saying because they're kind of that plop rather than a shaped tube. Um, definitely coyote scat can look like bear scat, but it's a much smaller amount, but they can, it really depends on what they've eaten. It can just become a loose stool like that and look a lot more like a bear scat. I've seen a lot of coyote scats like that. Cool. So Nav says um, that they recently saw some funnel shaped impressions in a sandy soil. Would that be from an insect or maybe a rodent, do you think? Um, well, okay, if they were, say, around this big, Nav, and maybe that deep, that sounds like, if it's sort of a conical shape in the sand, that sounds like perhaps an antlion track that you're talking, or trap that you're talking about. There's these little antlion larvae who wait at the bottom of these traps, and they're shaped like this, so that ants and others will fall in, and the antlion is at the bottom there and it'll catch the animal at the bottom. Without seeing it, I can't be 100% sure, but it sounds like what you're talking about. Great, Tim is wondering if you can tell the difference between black bear and grizzly bear scat. Uh, generally, you know, there's not a lot of grizzly bear around here, but the grizzly bear scat that I've seen is just um, kind of like what I was talking before. It's just like um, another magnitude larger I'm not an expert in grizzly scats since I don't see it very often. So that's really all I could say at the moment. Awesome. So we have a question here wondering if a very furry, long, large scat on a trail is probably coyote. Yeah, most likely um, if it's twisted. The difference between whether it be a bobcat or, because you could also see a big furry, long bobcat scat the coyote scats will be more twisted. Their digestive systems twist those scats on the outside more, and it might end in a twist on both ends, whereas a bobcat scat will look more chunky, even though maybe those chunks could be connected. Um, and it might only be twisted on one end. So likely it could be a coyote, could also be a bobcat, yeah. Awesome. Some people are wondering if you could briefly um, Summarize the difference between skunk, raccoon, and beaver tracks one more time. Okay, great. Um, so skunk are skunk are super small. Here I have a track cast. You can make these with uh, pouring plaster into the track when it's wet. Um, real easy. You can just mix it in a cup and pour it in and then wait for it to dry. So skunk are really small. Look how small that is compared to my finger, right? Here's raccoon. So you can see right away this size difference, right? There could be baby raccoons, and they, it's true, they do have five toes, both of them. Skunks are always going to show in the hind track this, um, this little ridge in the middle of the hind track, the skunks that we have around here. And also, they have way longer claws. Thanks, Sally. 
than the uh, raccoons. See how long those claws are. And beaver, I don't unfortunately have a um, track cast of beaver, but beaver are going to be even longer. If this is your raccoon track, the beaver track is going to be like this, of that, that bigger one. Then the little one may be like, just like that. But partly size, and the beaver track is webbed. You can see there, it's got webbing between the fingers. Raccoon and skunk definitely don't have that. Does that cover that one? Yeah, that's great. We have um, two different questions here um, that are wondering if you can point to any resources that are helpful for learning about and IDing animal gates, especially for beginners. Oh yeah, okay, great. Yeah, thanks Sally. There's that, um, these are my recommended guides. Um, so one of them is this book. Uh, which is on there, um, Mammal Tracks and Sign. This is a great book. It's kind of a very thick book. There's a lot in it. So if you're into the look at the, at the bottom there, there's also pocket guides. Um, and then there's also another, uh, there's a web resources page, right, Sally? Because, yeah, right there, Earth, look at the bottom there, earthskills.com. There are videos on there of animals in motion to really understand the gates of animals. That is a super great resource for that. And just to look at tracks in general online and have them identified at naturetracking.com, that one in the middle is really a great resource. There's ton hundreds of uh, track photos on there. So we have a question here. Um, Wondering that in areas where there's grazing, how can you tell domestic calf tracks from elk tracks? Are they always rounder? Yeah, the domestic, the calf tracks are always rounder and, and they're going to always be associated with adults. You're not just going to see a calf out there by itself. It's going to be with the adult calves somehow, you know, even if it's wandered off a little bit, but somewhere around there, you're going to find the adult tracks. But there is that roundedness that's different. Cool. So we have a question asking, what is scat that looks like black tar on a rock? Oh, yeah, that's really cool. Um, uh, most of the time, that is fox scat. Uh, but I have also seen that done by wild turkeys. Um, they call that a sequel scat. It comes out of a different part of their digestive system. And it will just look like a, a smear. And actually, yeah, both of those you can see around the Audubon Center. And I, I've been kind of doing a little study on like, what is the difference between those two? But both of those animals will do that. Cool. Maybe one last question. Um, Lynn is wondering, do pack rats leave a trail drag mark? Pack rats. Um, not so much, but they can but it's not always typical of them. The one rodent I would say around here who leaves more of a tail drag more often, well, maybe the two, <laughs> would be deer mice and kangaroo rats when they're going slowly. But wood rats can do that. It's just not like their typical mode that I've seen. Great, thank you so much, Anne. Yeah. Um, all right, did you want to say anything else? I just wanted to thank all you guys for being part of this and thanks for hosting me and thanks for everybody who took part. This was a lot of fun. And hopefully I'll be able to do some in-person um, tracking in the future and some of you can join me. Yeah, thank you to everyone who attended. Um, I just want to point out that this webinar will be posted, the recording of the webinar will be posted on our Facebook page as well as on our YouTube channel. You can find us if you search for Audubon New Mexico. Um, so if you want to reference back to some of these slides or listen to the webinar again, you are welcome to do so. I also just want to point out that we have a couple of other webinars coming up over the next couple months, so be sure to check those out, including a series on the Rio Grande and a guide on birding. Um, so thank you very much for attending. And again, we dropped the um, 
link to our donation page in the chat box. And if you're able to donate, we really appreciate that. And that supports our education programs here in Santa Fe. So thank you all and have a great week. Great. Thanks.